Welcome back to Joystick Justice League, part two of our debut double XL sized episode of our new show, Shortlist. I'm Mike Fursios. I'm Joe Morin. And today we are running down the top 15 characteristics that truly define a legendary game and a memorable game that basically goes through the ages. In part one, we went through numbers 10 to 15. Let's go on to the ninth characteristic on our list. This one, Joe, is a game that proved that a simple idea can be a blockbuster. So what do you think of when we think about this type of characteristic? I mean, uh, you know, let's go right back to the beginning. Pong. Oh. That, 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 there, there's a game that very, very, very simple, but wow. I mean, just uh, incredibly fun. You know, just, I mean, who, who, who would have thought that just uh, two lions hitting a dot around could be fun? But I mean, Jesus, even to this day, to still pick up a game of Pong, it's still fun. Yeah, we talked about this in part one, about the idea of it being competitive, easy to pick up, but a great game, in my opinion, like, and I'm really, I just kind of thought of this, like, what really defines virtual reality, Joe, and I, and I think it really comes down to just a blissful, zen-like sense of control. Pong had incredible, intuitive, non-latent control for its period. I mean, you play one of those old Pong machines, like it's very mm -hmm. precise, you know, and that's what made it seem realistic. Like I'm sure Pong was the shit back then. It probably looks simple mm -hmm. to us now. People were probably thinking, oh, this looks so great. You know, it's so awesome. I, I think really what le what lends us to like a virtual out of body experience that, that becomes truly competitive and passionate is really that sense of control that Pong really nailed. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then you, we go on to Pac-Man. Which, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, th th there, there's a game, again, very simple in concept. I mean, not only fun, but also difficult. And many different strategies you can bring to it, right? There's so mm -hmm. many different ways to play Pac-Man. You've got the leaderboard to stay competitive. You've got, like, a rudimentary story, you know, trying to meet up with Ms. Pac-Man and fall in love, ch avoid mm -hmm. ghosts, you know, di different game mechanics. You know, that's the thing. It really just, it, it appealed to so many different age groups it, it crossed gender borders it brought right. non-gamers into gaming that that really is uh, like a true feat when you can take somebody who hates video games and get them to sit down in, in front of a screen and do something like that like what are more recent examples of that uh, you know, uh, uh for me one that, that, that stands out right away is uh, angry birds definitely you know, the, 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 again very simple but i mean fun and, and simple and easy to pick up I mean, I mean, with the exception of maybe Candy Crush, there's a game that even non-gamers have picked up to and really latched onto, just for the, the pure simplicity and the fun. It seems like it's it's puzzle games, typically. Like, Angry Birds really is a puzzle game. Mm -hmm. Plants vs. Zombies, it's, yeah, it's tower defense, but it's, it's got puzzle elements. Candy Crush, obviously, it's a puzzle game. Maybe it's that, What what is it that, maybe that's what it, what it needs to, to, to bring somebody who's a non-gamer in. It's, it's that sense of, of, maybe is it a mental challenge? I over a physical so. one? I, th I think it's more of a mental thing that uh, it actually, the, there's some thinking, and the, there's some thinking and some strategy involved, but not overwhelmingly so, right? Which I, it which it I makes think, you uh, feel smarter for playing it? Exactly, yeah. And I, that's that's really is. I mean, you gotta look at it. Like, look at words with friends. You know, look how big that is now. Look at uh, you know what's that? Four pictures, one word, or whatever that genre is. Just mm -hmm. very simple kind of brain teasers. You know, it's it, everybody loves trivia. You know, you don't you don't need a huge budget to make an amazing game. Like, let's let, those are obvious examples. Let's even go into like more kind of hardcore gaming examples. Like, look at something like Limbo. Yeah, black good. and white, man. No yeah. dialogue. What makes that game great? It, it's uh, just the the atmosphere and uh, you know just the uh, the open and endness of the story. I mean, because you're not being told very much. Uh, this is a, a good example. Uh, Limbo is a good example of a game that, uh, I th like I said this about previous games that we've talked about before. That uh, I think everybody kind of portrays their own kind of personality into the character. 
and uh, you know just that game very very simple in concept but again can also be very hard and gruesome at some time but uh, take yeah just taking a, a simple idea and uh, and making it su- successful I mean uh, th- that game in particular limbo I mean uh, for when it comes to independent games I mean that that really blew that industry out of the water I mean that, that game did extremely well and uh, wow I mean you know it, it's a g- good example uh, you know that, that uh, you don't have to uh, throw a lot of money to, to actually make a cool experience when it comes to games. You just have to get people to use like lateral thinking, you know, yeah. and that's what's really what's unique to video gaming over a lot of other genres in the sense that you really have to bend your mind to, to think, to get around some of these games, you know, like this or like another recent example, I guess, of like a simple game. I mean, look at Journey, you know, again, mm. what you're talking about putting yourself into the character, you know, letting yourself write the narrative as it, as it comes along. That that sense of, of of bliss that comes out from from doing something simple, but allowing yourself, because you're not thinking about control, because you're not thinking about challenge, I, I, you're concentrating on the atmosphere, the sound. It's really engaging other senses other than just, you know, your fingers and your twitchy senses. It's, it's making you think outside the box and I, and I think that's that's really I, I, not everybody can make a what I'm trying to say is not everybody can just take a simple idea and make a blockbuster like why is it that Angry Birds succeeded where other simple ideas failed why did Journey become such a big thing when it shouldn't have Joe what is it about the sim- you know what I'm getting at here yeah with the Angry Birds in particular I, I think uh, uh, a big part of it had to do with the, the platforms that, that this game was released on with uh, especially portable devices like phones and, and tablets, especially phones. I mean, that, that here's a device. I mean, that literally almost every person owns. So I mean, just immediately accessible to everybody. Because I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's some people out there that don't have a smartphone. But I mean, I, I would say the majority of people do. So I mean, right away you're 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 you're, do, you're releasing a game that everybody literally can have access to. Like Flappy Bird, which exactly. is you know, and of course that's free. But you know, so was Angry Birds for a while. But it's also, mm-hmm. you know, the the it's it's not cumbersome either. It's it's unencumbered, you know, by controllers and hardware. It's something you already have in your pocket that you use for daily use, and all you have to do is touch the screen to make it work. Yeah. I mean, really, how much simpler can you get than that? It's a it's a very personal kind of. I've said this before about playing on a touch screen when it comes to gaming. Like it, it just it feels like a very kind of intimate kind of a personal way to play a game. You know, when, when you're you're in direct control of what's happening right on the screen that you're playing on. So, but a lot of games of this, like, why Flappy Bird, Joe? Why did it become as big as it did? Like, what is it? What it made that oh. game so big? Like, because everybody's trying to make the next Flappy Birds, Joe. So, if you had to give advice to a developer who wants to make the next great game, but not doesn't have a huge budget and wants to do something simple, what made Flappy Bird so big? Let's tear that one down a bit. Flappy Bird, I, I mean, uh, I mean... Again, the, the the simplicity and just the, the accessibility of it, and and uh, you know coming out at, at a time when uh, you know the, the, especially in the mobile market, I mean just it's uh, you know everybody has these devices. I mean, and just the fact that it, that it's not uh, you know the, the the cost of being like especially like a PC gamer or a console gamer is always going to be a little bit high. I mean, these games are very affordable and free for the, for a large majority of these. I, I think that that uh, has a lot to do with it. It's also the challenge, Joe. I think it's the bragging rights of saying, "Oh, I got to you know uh, level 150 of uh, of uh, Flappy Bird," which is yeah. mind-numbing, ridiculous to me. But yeah. if that's your thing, go right ahead. <laughs> but you know, it, it, yeah. it's also that sense of feeling hardcore, but without having to go down the true hardcore route. I mean, I, you know, not everybody who's great at Flappy Birds is immediately going to go start picking up Dark Souls. No, you know, it, it just seems like that right amount of challenge. That's mm-hmm. accessible enough, but without being too hardcore. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree with that. With that. Yeah, because there's a lot of simple games out there that don't really require a lot of challenge. This at least, it, it's it, and you know, and like it's it's repetition too. I think you know, look look mm. at Cookie Clicker, man. Like, love it or hate mm. that game. That's it's kind of started its own genre too. Very simple idea, almost blockbusterish. Why why would somebody wanna? Why do people sit around clicking a cookie all day? Like, what what do you think the appeal is? I don't, you know, with, with, you know, also with, also with Flappy Bird, I, I, I think what, uh, what really kind of launched that into a, to a baseball. I, I think it had a lot to do with just word of mouth. 
is that uh, people picked up this game and, and just say, hey, you know, just because, you know, pretty well anybody could pick this up. I mean, it was just, uh, I think a lot of it got just spread by word of mouth and say, hey, here's this cool, simple game, you know. Have you seen how downward. hard this stupid game is? Like, can you can exactly. you get past level two? You know, maybe and maybe you know maybe the Mario assets were played a big factor too. I think that familiarity comes into yep. it again too. It's like you're not just playing a game, but you're also playing something that kind of reminds you of playing Mario Brothers. You know, and I think that that really plays into like that suture, which we're going to be getting into later at the top of the list. Uh, suture is like a filmic term is a film term where which describes the effect of being able to keep an audience glued to say mm-hmm. your film with in that and and stay inside that imaginary space without having that broken by say like the fourth wall like by say like a bad edit or a bad mm-hmm. acting performance like keeping you completely immersed within that experience and not able to snap out of it that's what suture is and you know that that's that's what those games get right Yep. Let's go to number eight on the list. Let's talk about uh, we're talking about uh, things that make games truly legendary and stand the test of time. Let's talk about games that actually push hardware technology as a whole forward. That have actually been responsible for for major shifts in, in gaming hardware. Let's talk about some of those those games that that, that truly are remembered for that. Well, let's let's look at first of all. Let's look at uh, Final Fantasy VII. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, uh, th- there's a game that, that really launched the the, re- the original PlayStation into a mass appeal. I mean, I mean, this game t- to this day is still fondly remembered by people. Uh, I, I, I think you could, uh, I think most people would say that it's probably their favorite Final Fantasy game. And uh, at that time, I, I believe you know, with the exception of the PC, it was about the only platform that that game could be probably done on. Yeah, because the main competition, and, and they made note of it in the promotions back then the main competition was the n64 and mm-hmm. and, and yes the n64 technically was superior i mean you know look at goldeneye you know the, the ps1 tried hard to replicate couldn't do goldeneye you know just it wasn't possible the, the ps1 had very uh, primitive uh, shading and and uh, 3d technologies but that's the thing what it lacked in 3d it, it made up for in 2d and in, mm. and in size and scope. And Final Fantasy VII for its time was a massive game. Three CDs, that's like, you know, 700 megs a piece, you know, about two and a half, almost two and a half gigs, or yep. I, I hope I'm getting this right right now, but I'm thinking off the top of my head. But it was a massive game, and, and on N64 carts, you couldn't do it. Like, you just, at the time, it would be ridiculous to try to fit that much data onto a cart. And, mm. and really, that is why Square Enix or Square Soft back in the day kind of avoided the N64 because the PS1, even though, yeah, maybe it was inferior graphically, it had the size capacity on those CD-ROMs to yeah. really take RPGs to that next cinematic level. And yeah. like you said, the PC was really the only other platform that could do it. And damned if I knew anybody my age that could actually afford a PC to run that other than the hardcore players. Most of us yeah. could only afford a PS1, and that's where we played Final Fantasy VII. And that's really, like, among that, Metal Gear Solid and Castlevania are, the, like, the three main games that kept, like, in my opinion, there are more, like, Resident Evil, but really the top three games that kept PS1 competitive yep. in that generation. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, the... the just touch on it, the Metal Gear series. I mean, th- oh, those yeah. games. Those games have always been known for pushing the, the uh, for pushing the hardware forward. And another one that, that uh, you know that uh, the, the first PlayStation. You know that, that was another one of their marquee uh, titles. And also the Metal Gear Solid 4, which was originally slated to be released on PS2, but then as as the game went further into development, they realized, hey, you know what? This isn't going to be enough. We're going to hold back, and we're going to go with PS3. Well, yeah, let's it, yeah. So, sorry, I want to rewind mean, a bit before you go back to Metal Gear Solid Four. We'll come back to that. Let's yeah. not skip over the PS2 era. Let's let's just rewind okay. for a sec. Metal Gear Solid One was like how many discs? Like two or three discs, right? Yeah, it was. At big. that point, like it was like Final Fantasy Seven CDs aren't enough. No. PS2 went DVD, man. Well, yep. well, what was it? The sat- oh, the Dreamcast was still like CD-ROM at that point. Yep. Again, games p- pushing technology. There was no way Metal Gear Solid Two and Three were gonna they're gonna put that on like what four or five CD-ROMs or something like that. 
No. So, but getting back to Metal Gear Solid 4. Now, so you were talking about that. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just want to kind of address that. Yeah. You know, it, it, like, like I said, you know, originally it was going to be on the on the PS2, but, uh, you know, they realized, hey, you know, this isn't going to be quite enough, and then they saw that uh, PS3 was going to be on Blu-ray, which allowed even more storage and to, to be on a single disc. You know, no, 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 mind you, there was a bit of a trade-off here. I mean, because of the, the size of this, I mean, there were multiple very long loading times. But, uh, you know, you know, other than that, I mean, I mean, those games, the Metal Gear series, I mean, was always known for really kind of pushing the, the hardware capability. Well, and that was it, man. Like, Metal Gear Solid 4 at the time was a technically ambitious game, man. Like, they, yeah. they made no mistake, even in the game, saying that... Um, what, what did they say? Like, oh, time to put it, pop in disc two. Oh, wait a minute, this is the PS3. It uses Blu-rays. You don't need to change discs. Taking yeah. a shot at like the competition of the 360, you know, exactly. running off of DVDs, you know, and, and that's again just like you know, Sony's in Japan. Kojima's big over there. You know, you don't think these people are talking to each other and 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 push it. It's like what happened with the PS4. The PS4 is designed upon the needs of developers and what they're working on now and what they have planned five, ten years from now. Mm -hmm. and, that, and I think Sony, more than anyone, has been responding. And, and, and that's why they've increasingly become a thing every generation, because they, they constantly react to what the industry needs. Not only now, but in like five, ten years from now. So on the flip side, let's look at Halo on the Microsoft side. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's a game that uh, you know was uh, going to be really just PC, and then got moved over to the Xbox as well. That's right, and, and you can really tell that the Xbox was was pretty much designed around that game. That was still like one of the greatest looking games for the Xbox. Um, but that, that again, just like that's when, when you cut, it's you know, like it's not all about graphics. Like obviously, Halo played really well, mm -hmm. and it uh, obviously it invented like the modern control scheme that Call of Duty perfected. We all know that. But would it have been as big as? as it was if it hadn't also been that technical behemoth that was really like the showcase for the Xbox because the Xbox it was the first console for Microsoft PS2 was a behemoth like having yep. massive support across the globe they needed something huge to come out with so and that's the thing like you're saying Halo PC game how do you make a PC game on consoles will you make a PC based console and that was really a turning point for the industry when the the original Xbox was designed and really we have Halo to thank for really bridging the gap between PC and console gaming which is getting closer all the time. Yeah, because I mean if, if you were to, to get right into the guts of that original uh, Xbox, I mean it really was a scaled down PC. It absolutely you was. Know, with, with them, uh, you know, with uh, kind of the goal of, of being able to port a lot of those PC games over to that. You know, thankfully they saw more than just PC ports on that system. But I mean, uh, it was really built around like, like a PC kind of architecture. Yeah, the first system to have a, a hard drive. Yep. You know, the PS2 got into the game later with Final Fantasy XI. You know, you could add a hard drive to it. Then the slim PCs, I think, had the built-in Ethernet. They started going mm -hmm. online. And the Xbox, that's not only the other thing about really bringing computer hardware into the, the console scene, but also online. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's uh, that's a whole other ballpark there. But that really, I mean, Halo, you know, we have the... It really defines the basis for the modern military shooter. But also, like you're saying, like it really bridges that, 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 that previously very wide goals between the PC elitists and the console douchebags like us. Um, <laughs> let's move into number seven on our list of 15 characteristics that define legendary games. A game that took a different medium. So we're talking about comics, TV, books, movies, different medium of entertainment altogether. A game that took a different medium to new and unique gaming heights only possible in gaming. Yeah, and uh, you know my favorite example here is... Uh, the Batman games. Now, for, for uh, specifically, for a long time, which ones? Uh, I would say, especially the uh, Arkham Asylum. I mean, there, there were some, there were some good and some bad uh, Batman games uh, early in the, the day. You know, the, a, hint, a couple of good ones on, in the early days, but uh, kind of uh, lost its lost a little bit for a while. But then the uh, Arkham Asylum came uh, out, and it was tied uh, very closely to the. Uh, to the comic books and the uh, the animated series, which was extremely popular, and I was particularly fond of. But it it, it just it, it nailed that that Batman feel. It it felt like a real Batman game. 
Yeah, it's it's like it blurred the line between video game and comic, where it really felt like a yeah. living comic. And, and you know, I'd say that up until then, the only thing like superhero games were always a dicey affair. Up until Arkham Asylum, I think the superhero game really went into like the major leagues. You know that Spider-Man Two, you know, was was really big in terms of being a great you know license, but that was a movie license. This really, like you said, stuck to the comic books. Yeah. Just really, even, really found that line that a lot of other comic book inspired games couldn't find. And they even uh, why made, you know, and they, they even made another really smart move is that they actually, when it came to the story, they I mean they, they took a guy Paul Dini who has, has written some of the the best Batman episodes in, in some in comic books, you know, and uh, you know just uh, you know not going about it in a, like a half-assed way, like they they really got the right people involved. Yeah, you know what, just like you're saying, staying true to the roots. Yeah. Of the form, like remembering that's a video game, but it's also a comic book adaptation. It's not just all video game. Like, yeah. and that's the thing. It, 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 on the flip side too, is yes, it stays true to the roots of the Batman comic, but it also remembers to be a damn good game. And, and, and that's the other half of it is that it's no, it's not only true to the source material, but it introduced new mechanics of fighting and stealth that are now copied by pretty much every other third party, th uh, third person action stealth game. I mean, those Arkham Asylum mechanics were even copied in Uncharted 3 and like Sleeping Dogs and pretty much anything now. The the whole counter system, the, the it, it just felt right. Like everything you did felt Batman. It never felt like it was tacked on to make the game more challenging or to remind you as a video game. Everything felt like it was right within that universe. And, and I can just, and now that Rocksteady's back on, on board to do <laughs> Arkham yeah. Knight, and we're getting the That's Batmobile. I, yeah. I think it's just going into the stratosphere. And I think a lot <laughs> of other people trying to make these comic book conversions could learn a lot from what mm -hmm. Batman or Asylum did right over all the other ones that failed. It was, again, true to the source material, but also pushed its own gaming genre farther. It wasn't just satisfied, like, say, Deadpool to just be a generic third person brawler yeah. that's based on a comic, but actually try to do something different as a game itself. And I think that's what really made the Batman Arkham games come up. What other other, other other examples of games that took a different medium? So we talked about comics. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about TV. <coughs> TV, well, immediately South Park. Stick of truth. All right, all right. Let, the, the, there's a perfect example of taking the, the, the actual med medium, which was TV and a game and just Integrating the, the two together, I mean, I mean, uh, even with, with the, the creators uh, of the series being right involved, getting right down dirty with the, the development of this game. And we've said it before. I, I mean, you can tell that uh, that this wasn't just something thrown together as a South Park game. I mean, that, that this is the way that uh, to, to properly go about this. I mean, uh, of recent, I mean, this is the best example of this. This is the right way to do it. Finding a way to make a game out of the TV show rather than turning yeah. the TV show into a game, which is what they tried to do exactly. before, and they failed. Trying to make South Park into a kart racer. Trying to make it yeah. into a first-person shooter. Trying to make it into this or that. You know, finally it felt like you were playing a television episode, but mm -hmm. for the f a television episode that you're making happen, that you're not passively watching, that's mind-blowing. That actually use the show's assets that worked episodically if you want to leave it that like i mean you could have played that in say half hour increments just like you'd watch a season of south park and be satisfied that way it, it blends two different mediums properly but it respects both you know it, it could have just been a big homage to south park like a lot of the family guy guy games are but they suck at gameplay because they're all about the jokes exactly. and south yep. park got that right man yep it was a game it was a good, yep. damn good one wasn't it it, it was it was it was a good uh, it was like it was like a really good South Park season, and then it was a good game. It was a to, good RPG. I mean, I mean it, it's just it, it's like I, I'm, yeah, like I just said it. Uh, I mean, this is the proper way to go about taking in a, a franchise and bringing it into the game medium. Yeah, that's right. Respecting the the medium it came from, it. but also respect the medium you're bringing it into. The fact that it still Absolutely. has to be a playable game. It can't just be a cop out like a lot of these Pixar, <coughs> pardon me, Pixar games are. You know, maybe minus Toy Story 3, which had a bit of a following, but most of them are mm -hmm. utter shit. Just like utter 
cash grabs, you know, just that it's like, mm -hmm. oh, we had a other shitty game idea. This is what they used to do back in the 80s with the LGN games for NES. Mm -hmm. Oh, we had one shitty game that we couldn't make, so let's, let's pop fucking Marty McFly on the cover and call it Back to the Future and put some <laughs> killer bees in it. You know, mm -hmm. that's, and that's the thing, you know, it's, it, you, that's really what the Walking Dead Telltale's Walking Dead got right. Yep. You know, and that's why I, it was such a massive success. Why? Why was? Why was? Why was this? What? What did Walking Dead do right over, say, Survival Instinct, or say maybe some of the other Telltale's games that did weren't so well received, like Jurassic Park, or mildly received, like Back to the Future? Why did Walking Dead make Telltale at the top? Well, first of all, just the fact that it's Walking Dead. I mean, I mean, the, the, obviously the following around it is. You think it was timing? And it was timing, and I, I think it was also a wise decision to not follow the the TV show too closely, and to not follow the the, the book the the graphic novels too closely. It, it seems to kind of find like a bit of a middle ground. It didn't it, it uh, uh, you know it's it, it didn't uh, try to uh, you know. I think I, I know what you're saying. It expanded yeah. the universe. It didn't yeah. just retread it. it. Exactly, you know, it didn't yeah. just make, oh, yeah. okay, we're just going to replay season one and two as a video game and make you no. act out all the sequels. No, it's like, yeah, this is a completely because, different universe tied to it. Yeah, because, I mean, then you would just be expecting what's going to happen and right. it would pull you out of it. So to, to tell a new story, but still in that same universe. And, and also, I, I think timing for the particular success of that game was, it was a big factor. I mean, Keeping your eye on the market, time, knowing what's hot. Absolutely, yeah. But again, just, you know, like, it's there's so many factors. Like, again, you know, the fact that it's tied into the TV show, like, it, it actually comments on things that would happen a year later in the TV show, in the plot. Like, when you're playing as Lee and you meet Dale mm -hmm. for the first time and you find out more of his backstory and that makes him more fully fleshed out as a character. Yeah. But, uh, you know, also just, again, we're always talking about, you know, what it did technically, but what it did in a larger meta sense to change gaming. It brought mm -hmm. in choice it brought in like intertwining multi narratives like multi multi tree narrative tiers that hadn't really been done properly yet like mass effect tried to give you some sort of cause and effect but really walking dead and, and like you know like heavy rain did this too but walking dead kind of mm -hmm. perfected that formula and set a trend for i think a lot of like narrative driven games to come yeah, and, and even uh, between you now with the, the second season coming out, it actually what you did in that in the, the previous actually car your decisions and what you decided to do actually carries over, and it becomes part of a, of a larger story that, that they're telling, which is which is pretty unique and uh, very cool too. Yeah, and, and you know what's it's funny too that um, I'm sort of I just thought of this like I was thinking about it's not such a legendary game, but it's it's a good example of a trend I see happening more and more that's going to get better when um, Stranglehold came out uh, for PS3 and Xbox 360, which was a sequel to John Woo's Hard Boiled, which came out in the 80s and hadn't had a sequel for over a decade. Not the greatest game, but you know what? For, for fans of the story and of Lieutenant Tequila and that whole universe, it was an expansion, especially considering the fact that at the time, Chao Yun Fat had aged quite a bit. But yep. in video game world, he can live forever. Look look at Aliens, Chloe, yep. and Marines. Love or hate that movie, you know, our characters look like they haven't aged at all. Michael Bean looks the same as he did back in 1986. And yeah. I think this is going to be a new way for aging Hollywood stars to crank out those sequels. Look at Ghostbusters, yeah. the video game, man. It's yeah. like Bill Murray and Harold Remis hadn't lost, had, like, yeah. hadn't aged at all in that Ghostbusters sort of sequel. Yeah. I think there's some potential for some other... Uh, the, these really uh, popular movies and, and stuff like I, I think we even mentioned uh, uh, not too long ago I think even like Blade Runner and some of these could, could be kind of rebooted kind of in this way by like expanding on the universe and not just retelling what's already happened that's right or not even like a prequel like as is the usual cop out Blade Runner mm -hmm. is a great example we're gonna we're gonna expand on this in like a top 10 movie to games episode in the future but I kind of want to touch yeah. upon Blade Runner again takes place in the same time as the movie but different characters just if you're invested in that very rich story universe of, uh, that uh, uh, Philip K. Dick and Ridley Scott created together I mean wow what, a, what a, an amazing experience for PC and yeah I hope that gets rebooted but I think we found a common line in this category is that 
to truly be a great adaptation of another medium, it has to not only respect that medium, but take it in new places that it could have never gone again. And I think those are all great examples. Let's keep going up the list here. Let us go on to number six on our list of 15 of the top 15 characteristics to define legendary games. Let's talk about a game that converted previously hardcore or niche games into accessible mainstream entertainment. Yep. Right away, XCOM stands out to me. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, here, here, here's a game that, that previously was a very hardcore strategy game that, that was extremely The whole genre, really. It, it was extremely difficult. It, fun to, to play, mind you, but it was, it was very hard. And then with uh, Enemy Unknown and Enemy Within uh, being released uh, recently, kept that hardcore feel to it, but also allowed some accessibility as well. Yeah, because you right? know what it did? It, like, it took a very complex PC-based game, and most of these RTSs up until recently were yep. pretty much PC-based. Fire Axis found that comfortable middle ground that nobody thought existed between... Yep consoles and PC RTSs where you could actually control a very complex RTS with your DualShock or your Xbox gamepad and it worked. You know, a, you know some people say and still say oh I'd rather have the mouse, but for me I have no problem. I feel completely in control mm -hmm. of that game every time I play it. And that's that's really got me into RTSs because I I was like one of those people that was like okay, I don't want to memorize a million different commands and have to know all these things on my keyboard to do and I don't want to know about you know uh, move points and, and 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 what they did people complained about XCOM they said that they dumbed it down I say no man they made it streamlined for a wider audience which is and they kept the difficulty which which was which is you, know, you have to make sure you have, you note that as well and uh, you know with uh, with that game I mean, up until that point uh, RTS is on consoles now, especially when it came to the control, it was very hard to do, and it was not really yeah. done all that well up until that point. Yep. And uh, boy, did they nail it with that. I mean, it, not an easy thing to pull off, because keep in mind that those games, were, like you said originally, were played with keyboard and mouse. Well, you know why and, they pulled it off, Joe? Because if you think about it, try explaining XCOM's controls, like Enemy Within or Enemy Unknown, to the layman without going through the tutorial. Probably, like, they'll, they'll look at you with, like, you know what you're, the hell you're talking about, but it's the tutorial, man. It's that tutorial that's one of the most, it's like Super Meat Boy, one of the most brilliant intuitive tutorials that really takes a complex idea and boils it down in an hour's time, giving you the basics that you need to spend the rest of this 30 hour plus journey. That's, that's key to taking these hardcore games and I hate to say this, dumb them down for a mass audience. <coughs> what are some yeah. other examples of that, Joe? Maybe, okay, because XCOM, you know, it's getting there. It's still not a huge thing. I think there's even bigger examples than that. Well, it's, uh, you know, what's a good, a good example that, uh, you know, tower defense games, I mean, uh, it's been a kind of a mix between, like, the hardcore and the casual bit, but uh, I think a game that really kind of nailed a nice middle ground with the uh, difficulty and fun was Plants vs. Zombies. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, th this is a... Uh, just taking, uh, I mean, z the zombie thing is is has been kind of overdone, I think, a little bit. But it, it it's a it took this idea of tower defense and it just actually made it very very accessible, but but uh, but still kind of uh, becomes actually extreme. Im extremely difficult the more you play it. Like uh, I've actually progressed really far in that game, and it, it it does get hard, but it it, it just it uh, nails that that. Again, like that, 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 that nice mix of fun and difficulty. You know why? It's, it's not just because it's cute. It's not because it has funny characters and music. It's because everything progresses logically. Everything unlocks yeah. properly to get you, mm -hmm. to, again, suit you into this game. Keep you coming back for more. You start yeah. off, well, I think the first level, you get the, the sunlight. And that's maybe it. like a pea shooter, and that's it. That's all you have to use. And then the next level, you unlock a new thing. But it gives you enough time to master each component until you get to where you need to go. And and that's that's really what you need when you when you have a complexity. <laughs> it's not throwing it all at once like like a lot of hardcore, especially 4X games are guilty of this all the time. You know, like Total yep. War, they're always out of everybody's grasp because they're just so complex. And I'd really love to see somebody master the 4X genre on consoles you know now that we have hardware that can actually handle these kind of games it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see what happens 
So that uh, is number six. Let's move on to number five, which is a game that is legendary that revitalized old ideas or genres into a modern context successfully and, and nobody would have seen it coming. For me, the uh, first one that, 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 that uh, kind of stands out for me is uh, NHL Hockey 92. You know, up, up until to this point, I mean, uh, hockey games were they, they were they were they were good and they were fun, like uh, Blades of Steel and whatnot. But Ice this hockey. Really took, yeah, but but this really, really took it into uh, started getting into that realm of where it uh, really became very fun and it actually felt started to feel like a proper and um, like you were saying, modernizing these ideas, right? It wasn't just having real players and, and real teams and gorgeous graphics, but it was just the sense of speed. First of all, it was like yes. the fastest game. Yeah. Blades of Steel, nice hockey, we're kind of slow games, you know. Yeah. And, and they didn't really have any AI. They didn't have any no. rules. I mean, I remember Blades of Steel, you could get icing, maybe. Yeah. But now you could get offsides. You know, yeah. you could get penalties. You know, you could see the ref mm -hmm. doing the signs. And then yep. you saw, and then, like, you see the actual names of these characters, and they all seem to have their own abilities. Like, they're all actually weighted differently. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, don't, I don't remember the rosters too well of, of who was in 92, but Lemieux would play like Lemieux. Yeah. It Gretzky just, it would it play like Gretzky. That, it just it took away from that kind of a generic feel to... <laughs> To, to uh, actually feeling more like reality, right? And yeah, it just needs in the middle there. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's not to say there weren't other Sims at that time. There was Wayne Gretzky Hockey, which for PC yeah. and stuff like that. But it, it found that middle ground, which is why it became so big because it wasn't too arcadey, like say Hit the Ice was or Blades of Steel. It wasn't too over people's heads, you know, like Wayne Gretzky was, where it was pure Sim. It was just something mm -hmm. right in the middle. But. Uh, just really taking advantage of that Genesis hardware, you know, yep. you know, at, at an early like that came out in '91. This was the same mm -hmm. time that the Super Nintendo had come out and was wowing yep. everybody with Super Mario World and Final mm -hmm. Fight and Final Fantasy yep. II. But to see a game this blazing fast and it would become even more apparent when '93 came out on Super Nintendo and it just chugged. We, we mentioned this in part one, but yep. I, I'm glad you brought this up because really, that changed the game. Like that in Madden 92 Good. really changed the game the, the, in those yep. couple of years. You have this Switch now, so you know the, the games aren't broadcast anymore now. It's like this top-down view which really opens up the playing field and really is what allows for for the strategy that would slowly come into the games through their yearly progressions. Like you, you notice that Madden 92 was so much more different than 95 in terms of the amount of plays you can run, the AI. Yeah. But it was really just that utter big shift in platforms yep. like and done and the way of looking at the game like thinking outside the box you know another good example with uh, bringing you know, these old ideas into a modern context would be uh, the original uh, uh, Call of Duty 4 of the modern warfare right because up until this mm -hmm. point I mean it was just World War 2 shooters after World War 2 shooters after World War 2 shooters it just it got to the point where it was like you know or what? space shooters I'm like Okay, World War Two has just been done to death, and finally, modern combat. You know, the, the, this was, uh, you know, finally, finally took it out, out of that. I mean, I mean, World War Two shooters. I mean, uh, uh, that's great, but it finally brought it into the modern day. You know why? And it was, it was, it was, it was because, yeah, it, it addressed what was happening with the whole Af uh, the, the 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 war in Afghanistan and stuff like that. It, it was especially Modern Warfare Two yep. was speaking directly to the whole mil military culture. But you know, it it, it really just uh, it really it just set a new bar. You know, it it, it just mm -hmm. took it just trimmed the fat of all shooters before it and, and just really really set the standard for what shooters had to be later on and I think everybody kind of copies that formula. Uh, for me, a big game that that really kind of surprised the shit out of people, um, taking a dead genre and, and breathing loon life into it and, and basically creating, and also creating its own genre, which we're gonna get into later, mm -hmm. Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the PS1. Came out, uh, I believe, 96, 97. This mm -hmm. was like a couple of years after the platformer was basically dead, done, dusted. Like the Genesis, late Genesis Super Nintendo eras really just killed 
the platform where everybody was trying to make the next mascot. Everybody was trying to do the next big Mario or Sonic, so you had shit like Bubsy and oh, yeah, there's tons Booger of Man and Booger Man. All this crap. <laughs> oh, what was it? Uh, Frantic Flea or something like that. Just, yeah. just awful, awful, uninspired garbage. Just missing the whole idea of what platformers, what makes them great. And the other thing too was that in the night late night late nineties it was the N sixty four era right so mm -hmm. everybody wanted three D nobody wanted flat two D stuff that was old school everybody wanted three D Mario sixty four you know everything had to be three D at that point everybody was expecting Castlevania to be three D on the PS one no man they went two D hand drawn art man that stunned yep. everybody and yep. god if it wasn't the most gorgeous thing we had to look at at the time just musically with this yep. symphonic soundtrack and just taking all like different like not only taking old school platforms but creating the metroidvania formula that is basically like copied now not yep. creating it like but basically perfecting that metroidvania formula so yep. just you know it, just what did you have to say about that joe and, and uh, to, to expand on this with, with, with another game, you know, the, 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 this fits this uh, this point so well you know, with uh, revising old ideas to a modern context. Take Fez, okay? Now, like, here literally is a game that starts off in 2D perspective and then, boom, 3D, right? Uh, the, 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 this, this almost kind of uh, embodies what this topic is about here because, I mean, I mean it, it, it literally you're playing a 2D game and then he gets this ability to turn the world into 3D, right? Yeah, because when you first start playing Fez, it, it just seems like, okay, it's an old school pixelated platformer, puzzle platformer. It's 2D, you know, it's kind of retro looking. And then of course you get the Fez and then you see the world spin around and it blows your mind. And, and that, that game is littered with references. And, and it, and it kind of goes, and, and it relates to Castlevania in the sense that the reason why these genres were allowed to be revitalized again was because it perfected things that were done wrong before. Like Fez is a big, big love letter, old games, but it, it bypasses all those old mistakes that we've 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 evolved from into mm -hmm. making something that works better than it could have back then. Absolutely. You know, same thing with Castlevania. It brought back t like no latency, like fluid controls and gorgeous game design into what pl and challenge which is what platformers had forgotten about in the in the early 90s when they was just trying to create a new character or a new gimmick or or a new mascot but they forgot about what about the mechanics of why something like Mario was so great because it was hard because it was it was designed perfectly and that's what Castlevania Symphony of the Night brought in and then a couple generations later we have Rayman Legends doing it again yeah, yeah, yeah. platformer gets stale we get Super Meat Boy and Rayman Legends come out and to revitalize it again and, th and th th thankfully so for those, because I, I mean, I, uh, th th there was a bit of a period there where kind of games so regularly became a, kind of a little too easy, and then thankfully, boom, these kind of good old, harder kind of games, like uh, in my opinion, like the way these games should be, you know, they're, they're nice and difficult, still fun, but uh, yeah. not, but not too much of a pushover, right? But also difficult in a new modern sense, not Absolutely. being difficult because it's a pain in the ass like it was in the NES yeah. days where games weren't programmed properly so they were difficult. Yeah. Now it's finding new ways to be difficult, fixing those programming mistakes we used to laugh at, but bringing in something new. And again, yeah. Rayman Legends, great example of that, right? Yeah. It, it's just, it, it's one of the most beautifully constructed platformers ever, you know, but we, we had to evolve to get to that point. It's like, it's like yeah. look, look at the Towerfall Ascension. Yeah. People are like, oh, you know, this game, would we have a Mario if this game existed in 1985? I don't think this game could have existed in 1985 because it fixes so many things that other games like it have tried to do and perfects it, yep. which is like really pastiche. Like, it's just like, it's an homage, but it's also a moving forward into right. the future. Yep. Uh, so let's keep going on. We'll do one more topic. We'll take a break and we'll come back for the top three reasons why games are legendary and stand the test of time. Number four on our top 15 list, short list, of course, short list. Uh, number four, the game makes new leaps forward in narrative storytelling that other media couldn't even possibly do. Yeah, this is a big one here. This is, uh, you know, what uh, we mentioned uh, before, it's kind of bridging the gap between uh, other forms of media, especially movies and TV and gaming. You know, for, for me, a, a big one that stands out here, we've already mentioned this, is Journey. Okay, here, here's a here's a game that uh, 
in a kind of a minimalist kind of a way, tells a very engrossing story that, like, like I said, everybody projects their own character and own emotions into this very, very short game, mind you, but a game that, uh, that, that thankfully, you know, and thankfully it wasn't uh, drawn out because any, any longer than it, w- it was would have been just would have been right now here's a game that, that just it just it creates that that experience you enjoy it and it doesn't drag on right so, so why some, couldn't that game be done as like why why is that game not a movie why is that game not why is it like what what makes it why couldn't it be done anywhere else why is journey unique because you're 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 actually in control of that you're not just you're not, you're not just uh sitting back and watching you're actually engrossed into it and actually you you, you are that character yeah, it's, it's the difference between kind of say like watching an Antonioni movie where it's just a lot of still shots and yeah. meditative sequences. Yes, it gives you time to reflect, but I think when you add that controller and that sense of of discovery mm-hmm. and that you're directing the the action, I think that's it. Just it allows for this greater set of zen that I don't think any other medium could really get. I think that's why Journey was so important in 2012. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, my other favorite example here is. Again, the Last of Us, right? Uh, I mean, I mean, this has taken, you know, at that time. I, I mean, I don't think I, I saw a movie at that time that has as good of a story as that game. Because it has a new type of <coughs> arc, Joe. I mean, like we, we're accustomed to a certain type of generic arc that works in a two-hour, on well, an hour and a half, to two-hour movie. It's it's a, it's known as the Shakespearean three-act arc, and it's it's mm-hmm. you know like a, a rising hill that kind of drops at Act Three. That that's kind of standard. That doesn't necessarily work in video games. When you got a game like The Last of Us that plays out for 15 hours, you've got many different arcs, different peaks and valleys, a different way of telling a story. And that's the thing, man. It's like it's a 15-hour game that's not episodic, but yet manages to tell a compelling story for like 15 hours. Yep. How do you do that, man? Like, I mean, nobody would sit and watch a 15-hour movie, you know? Like, how, how the heck do you keep somebody's interest? But yet, there's something about it being a video game that that makes it happen. What is that? Uh, you know, that, that's an interesting thing that you, that you bring up. It, it's kind of a hard thing to kind of put into words. It, I think it's just the, the the nature of gaming itself. The fact what that kept you coming back? What what like what kept you? What what would make you play what make you, longer I mean, than you would sit and watch a movie? I, I mean, uh, I mean, obviously the story kept me coming, but I mean the the gameplay and, and the, the melding of the of the two. Damn it! I mean, it's just it's such a perfect combination. You know, it, 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 you know, it just it, it played well as a game and told an excellent story at the same time. You know that, that that's just something that uh, with movies. I mean, yes, movies are, are fun to sit back and watch, but when you're actually in control of it, you know that, that that's how I really get immersed into a story, and especially with games. I mean, just because you are you're controlling the characters, you're not just passively sitting there watching. Yeah, and I think it's it's it, it almost lends itself more to like a novel in the sense that you can really get in that character's head. And especially when you take over the controls, like it feels like a different game when you're playing as Joel as a first when you're playing as Ellie. It's it's a completely different experience. But it's just um, you know it, it doesn't have the same arc as like a TV show or movie. It's it's, it's something different altogether. With the you know with the comparing the, the two, especially I think a movie in, in a game like say like Lost was a movie is kind of more to be just kind of sit back and kind of watch in one sitting, whereas a game like you can. Kind of ration it out a little bit, you know, and experience it. it, it There's and drawn out moments, you know, that you couldn't mm-hmm. really do in the pacing of a movie that has to run at two hours. Yep. You can draw out a more emotional experience, I think. And that's, again, what makes it more like a, a novel, but it's not a novel because you're not reading it, you're watching it, playing it happen. Yeah. Playing it happen. That's a great, great uh, expression there. I'll, I'll, I'll trademark that one. Um, <laughs> let's also talk about. Uh, Let's talk about The Walking Dead again. I mean, like the fa- of the idea of the choose your own adventure. You know, yeah, that that, that concept kind of went away. But, you know, and uh, where I first kind of latched on that to that experience was actually with books. There, was, there was actually it was called Choose Your Own Adventure. You yeah, that, that was literally you're reading, reading through a book, and and you could uh, choose between different decisions, and then based on that, you know, the story would unfold in different ways, and then this kind of carried over into gaming with uh, The Walking Dead or where, where you really felt like uh, like you would make a decision and then you would play through and then, and then you literally have moments where you think to yourself, geez, did I make the right decision? What's going to happen because I, I decided to do this? 
But yeah, it's also just like, you know, I, I see the where it starts from Choose Your Own Adventure, like the books, like you flip to page 56, then you pay, flip back to page 34, and maybe there's yep. two or three endings, but take that simple concept, explode it, yeah. where you have multiple trees with multiple different actions that are going to affect multiple different consequences. Maybe I'm making a, maybe that's more Mass Effect territory, but Walking Dead, you know, got there to an extent, mm -hmm. and, I, and I can see it, I don't think it's going to go away. I think this is going to be a, a new real way of extending life out of games like getting alternate endings you know getting different like you know giving the player a sense of choice is really again something that's that's unique to video games that you know like you said books have tried to do with choose your own adventure but it, it still felt kind of contrived you do yeah. it once you put the book down whereas walking dead you've got like what so many, ten different endings, you know, Heavy Rain, you got like ten different endings, yeah. Beyond Two Souls, like, it's 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 a different story every time, and that's just something completely mind-boggling, and I, and I think more developers have to try to tackle. And the way that they, they did it was really clever in that, too, and well, I think that, uh, that there's some replayability, and that you'll get a bit of different experiences. Sometimes the decisions they have to make, you, uh, you can't just sit back and go... Okay, here's my choices. There's, there's times where you literally have to make a snap decision. Just like in real life with some things you have to, you know, really have the, the time to think about, you got to make a snap decision and then you think back, oh, geez, you know, was that the right thing to do? Like it just, it has you questioning of whether the, these moral decisions that you made of whether you made the right or wrong choice, you know? Yeah, absolutely, and that just it just lends to just a completely unique experience. So that's yeah. we're getting up that list now. Where we're getting up to like the top three reasons uh, of what makes a game truly legendary. We're really trying to pinpoint this down like an intellectual level, and also try to kind of offer some direction for for maybe developers who are looking for that next big legendary title. What what really goes in the nuts and bolts of making these timeless classics? So we're gonna take another break. We're gonna come back for part three, where we go down the top three reasons. Why games are legendary. I'm Mike Frusios. I'm Joe Moore. Stay tuned, we'll be back.